In May of 2022, a group of 11 climbers became the first all-Black expedition to summit Mount Everest. The team was called Full Circle Everest, and their climb was written about by journalists all over the world. Full Circle was made up of outdoor experts, climbers, teachers, skiers, and snowboarders. There was also one U.S. Army veteran on the expedition, Damon Mullins. In 2004, we didn't understand what the war was. And so it was basically anything goes at any moment. And so I had to learn how to cope with that. The stress of that every day, the unpredictability of it, the sleeplessness, the pain. And so in a situation like that, what you try to do is try to control the variables that you can. That's your body, that's your health, that's your gear, that's your buddies. Everything else is out of your control. So I feel like the Everest expedition, I approached it in a similar way. Demond Mullins, who goes by Dom, isn't just a former soldier. He's also a sociology professor, a dancer, and an avid outdoorsman who's summited Denali and Mount Kilimanjaro. When Dom isn't on trail runs, lifting weights, and pushing his body to new limits, he's immersed in the world of academia. Dom is a PhD in sociology. In 2015, he conducted an ethnographic study of a group of combat veterans during their summit bid of Denali. Much of Dom's research over the years has focused on veterans and how nature can help them heal from PTSD, something Dom experienced when he came back from a tour in Iraq. I'm Shelby Stanger, and this is Wild Ideas Worth Living, an REI Co-op Studios production. Dom Mullins, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. Thank you for having me, Shelby. Okay, so you're a dancer, you're a climber, you're a sociologist, you're a professor, you're a speaker, you're now an author. You told me you were a veteran, and that's how you got into the outdoors. Oh, yeah. I mean, the outdoors, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn and, you know, it was Brooklyn in the 80s and 90s. It was rough Brooklyn. It wasn't there wasn't place to go outside and play. So I didn't know anything about the outdoors as a kid. Uh, I didn't. It wasn't hipster coffee shop, Brooklyn. No, absolutely not. It was the antithesis of that. You could not imagine that hipster coffee shop Brooklyn would ever exist. <laughs> so so that, that's where I grew up. And, you know, there wasn't any outdoor space. I didn't get outside much, you know, and I joined a military and the military was the first time that I experienced the outdoors. It was incredible, really. You know, there's a story that I like to tell when I was doing PT, physical training early in the morning in basic training. I'm in a cavalry unit. And, you know, we're in the, we're, they're rolling us in the mud, literally in the mud, you know, at 4 a.m. And we're doing sit-ups. And it was the first time that I saw a shooting star. And I was like, whoa, like that was incredible, you know? And I, and I looked around to see if anybody else noticed, but, you know, nobody else even cared. <laughs> but, you know, I was from Brooklyn. I'd never seen anything like that before. So, you know, and that was because my basic training was in Kentucky. And I can tell you that would have been in the year 2001 that I was in basic training earlier than September 11th. And I wouldn't understand the idea of, let's say, light pollution from 2001 until like, let's say, 2011. I wouldn't understand it for another 10 years, you know? And that's, that's by the time I'm 30 years old. I just didn't have people around me who understood things like that because they also grew up in the city and they weren't exposed to the outdoors or nature. And so we didn't even know what we were missing. So I'm really curious how you got to serving our country. In 1999, I graduated high school. I went to college right away for a semester. I did very well in college, but then I couldn't afford it. So I dropped out and I worked for a while. And while I was working, I found that I really needed to get back in school. And the only way that it seemed like it was possible while earning a living as well was the military. And so I, I actually joined the National Guard at first. But when I was in basic training, September 11th happened. And so the story took a turn and I wound up in the active duty. Wow. So active duty took you first to New York, I'm guessing. Well, so so first after September 11th, my unit was the first to be activated in order to respond to the terrorist attack. But I was still in basic training. About a month later, I would come back to New York City and then I would be 
part of my National Guard unit policing the city. So I did that for a while. And then in 2004, I got deployed, taken out of the National Guard and put in an active duty unit attached to the 1st Cavalry. And then we went to deploy to Iraq. And then how long did you serve in Iraq and in the Middle East? Because I know you're also in Kuwait. Yeah, so I was in Kuwait for like maybe like four months and I was in Iraq for 12 months. You know, after the war, a lot of people experienced PTSD. Did did you experience it? Yeah, I totally did. And uh, the interesting thing about it, PTSD, or any sort of emotional disturbance like that, is that you can read about it, someone could tell you about it, but when you experience it, it's very difficult for you to even identify what that is because it is existential. It's not like, you know, something that you can identify so easily like a cut, you know. This injury is literally the whole of your person. At times, you just don't feel right. And, you know, it's difficult for you to cope with that. It's difficult for you to understand that. And so you have to learn about yourself a lot and you have to be introspective a lot in order to deal with it. And at first I wasn't. I didn't really understand a lot of the reasons why I felt uncomfortable in spaces, reason why I didn't want to be in crowds, reasons why, you know, I would get out of the train station and I would literally run back to my apartment because I felt too vulnerable walking slowly. You know, it's actually kind of crazy because as soon as I got back from Iraq, that was like October 2005, I got an apartment literally right across the street from the college that I was attending right after I left high school. And um, as soon as school started again in January, I jumped in and I wasn't ready for it. You know, just like in terms of even like sensory sort of situation that it put me in so much stimuli all those people around you know people talking and different things loud sounds screeches doors banging you know it was a lot so i went through things like that for a while until a sort of self-awareness burgeoned about me and then i was able to understand that all right these things are common i'm dealing with these stressors in this particular ways there are other ways that i could deal with them so what sort of tools did you turn to that helped so i I can say this and I feel like I need to say this because it's the most honest thing, but I also feel like a hypocrite about it. And and I, I think it's important to sort of just lay that on the line. And that is one of the most important things or the most important step that you could take is a step toward community. Talking to people who have, who have gone through the same thing, talking to people who are dealing with it, talking to people who can understand, talking to people who want to listen, even if they don't necessarily understand, like all of those things are really essential. You find that social isolation is one of the greatest ills. It sort of multiplies the force of a lot of the other symptoms. And so I say I feel um, almost like a hypocrite saying that because I really... You know, I enjoy my moments of solitude. You know, I enjoy my space and my privacy. And so it was very difficult for me to even look for help when I needed it. And I just happened to find it first through a professor. And that professor introduced me to Iraq Veterans Against the War. And I became uh, very active in the organization and one of their national spokesmen at a time. As Dom got more involved with Iraq Veterans Against the War, he surrounded himself with like-minded people and organizations. It was in this work that he met our friend and former guest, Stacy Bear, founder of Adventure Not War. Stacy and Dom became close, and Dom's tenure as an outdoor athlete came to life. So how did you meet Stacy Bear? I was really a lucky guy. We were both working for an or a veterans organization in Colorado. This was around like 2009. And Stacy invited me climbing. You know, I'm from New York City. And aside from the military, I haven't had any outdoor experience. But I was in the cavalry and the military, so I spent a lot of time outside. And I, I realized that I liked it. But I missed it as a civilian. And when I went hiking with Stacy, we went up a 14er in Colorado. And I never had an experience like that in the civilian world. And it just... It blew my mind. And from there, I continued to go hiking and climbing, learn how to ice climb, rock climb, mountaineer. So I came into climbing really haphazardly like that. And I just found through my military connections and also my military service that there were lots of things that I enjoyed about climbing and that I, in fact, already knew how to do. He just takes you to a 14er? Like, he could have taken you on like a five-mile hike. And he's like, no, we're going to go hike a 14er. He, Dude, he took me to a 14er. And, you know... 
I'm from New York City. I don't even have hiking boots. You know, he, I'm asking him what to bring. When he showed up in the morning, I was wearing jeans, denim jeans, and Timberland boots. You know, that was all I had. <laughs> so, so he had to give me some other gear, man. He was like, dude, you're going to be hurting if you try to go up there like this. <laughs> That's so funny. So you made it. I made it. I made it and I loved it. What did you love about it? I loved how wild it was, man. It blew my mind. And one of the first things, I wonder if Stacy remembers, but the first thing that I asked him when we were up there, there's this picture of us. We're just trashed at the top. Like, wow, this is incredible. We're tired. And I'm like, dude, there's no railing up here. You could just fall off. <laughs> you know, I didn't get it. You know, it was that wild to me, you know, but that was the thing that I loved about it. Like just, it was untamed. It was just, you know, so imminent. Okay, so after that, you were hooked. What did you do next? So then, actually, it was a year from there that Stacy started Veterans Expeditions, and I just made a point to do all the events with Veterans Expeditions that I could. I learned how to ice climb with them, and I learned how to rock climb with them, and I learned how to mountaineer with them. So one thing that I came to understand intuitively when I started climbing was that I had what you would call social capital. Social capital is a term that we use in sociology to basically explain the way in which social relationships that a person has are conducive to a certain activity or a certain body of knowledge. Social capital is like let's say a currency, but in your social relationships, right? Because you know, let's say professional tennis players, it's easier for you to have, let's say a, a good tennis game. But if you don't have social capital that's conducive to that, then perhaps you may never even learn that you have a gift for playing tennis, right? And so I had social capital that was conducive to me learning mountaineering through my military connections. It was only because of people that I knew in the military that I even got introduced to this stuff. Veterans Expeditions didn't just teach Dom all kinds of outdoor skills. It also connected him to a community of climbers and outdoors people. On a trip to climb Denali with Stacy and famous mountaineer Conrad Anker, Dom was presented with the possibility of climbing Everest with the first all-black team. When we come back, Dom shares some of the best and scariest moments from Mount Everest and how the full circle expedition changed him. Last spring, Dom Mullen summited Mount Everest. It was something he could never have imagined doing back when he finished his tour in Iraq at 22 years old. For one thing, Dom wasn't even into hiking or climbing until years after he got back from the Middle East. For another, there weren't a lot of black people who had climbed Mount Everest. Between assembling a team, raising funds, and pausing their plans due to COVID, Preparing for the climb was a long, taunting task. When the team finally made it to Nepal, it was the result of dedicated planning, training, and hoping. What was it like to climb Mount Everest? That's something so few people have ever done. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, it was an incredible opportunity in my life. N not even just the summiting of the mountain, the entirety of the experience. So. You know, I spent five months in Nepal, almost six months in Nepal, so almost the complete visa. I got to meet so many incredible people, incredible athletes, Nepalese Sherpa people and their families, to see their villages and spend time there. I climbed so many other mountains in the Khumbu Valley other than Mount Everest, also to acclimatize. So I spent months there and it was just an incredible adventure. And the end, I mean, it was obviously naturally a crescendo, <laughs> you know, so... How did that time in the military eventually prepare you for this Everest climb? Yeah, I would say you have to understand what the war was like in that year in 2004. We didn't understand what the war was. And so it was basically anything goes at any moment. And so the interesting thing about that is that 
I had to learn how to cope with that. The stress of that every day, the unpredictability of it, the sleeplessness, the pain, the, you know, the loss, you know, I lost buddies there. And so in a situation like that, what you try to do is try to control the variables that you can. That's your body, that's your health, that's your gear, that's your buddies. Those are the variables in the situation that you can actually influence positively. Everything else is out of your control. So I feel like the Everest expedition, I approached it in a similar way. Like, look, the shit hit the fan and it's like, there's only one way and that's forward. And so let's figure out how to do it. And I tried to break it down into little pieces that were amenable and I approached them. And, and some days, even those pieces seem like, they were too large. They were earth shattering. But, you know, I kept at it and I had great support from, you know, Philip Henderson, the leader of Full Circle Everest. And I pulled through it. There are certainly things that I would do different. There's certainly a lot of things that I learned. But just like in the war, you know, that happens. And hopefully I'm able to adapt those lessons and move forward. Can you just give us a little bit about the timeline of your climb to Everest? Like how long it took and then what it was like to come back down? Sure. So the thing about Everest is that it would behoove you to do acclimatization runs on adjacent mountains because Everest, the most dangerous part of the climb is the lowest part of the climb across the icefall. So you don't want to cross the icefall like eight times because every time you cross it, something tragic could happen. So you climb an adjacent peak because you can prepare your lungs to breathe at the higher elevations on Everest without putting your body in jeopardy. And so we did that. And then we started to push to the higher camps and, you know, you push across the ice fall, which is it's hell every time that you do it. It's a very dangerous area. You want to move as quickly and safely as possible. And then you get to camp one. Camp one is a desolate place. <laughs> and then you get to camp two and camp two is like the most sort of hospitable camp in those higher elevations. It has a full kitchen and what have you, but then you push up to camp three and that's the highest that you go before you do your summit push. Any stories from the trip that you want to tell? Man, so many stories. Everest is incredible. The experience is expansive in every way that you can imagine. I mean, physically it's expansive, you know, intellectually, mentally it's, it's expansive. You know, what you learn about yourself, what you learn about the mountains and just even mountaineering. Spiritually it's expansive. And I believe that a lot of Sherpa and Nepalese people will tell you that I had to, I learned some Tibetan Buddhist chants while I was out there and had a number of puja ceremonies as well. So the whole experience is just all encompassing. If you're looking for an all encompassing adventure, especially one that would be encompassing of your bank account, then you should go to Everest. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not a cheap, cheap journey. You know, any, any scary moments that you can share? Oh, there were definitely scary moments. I would say the most scary moment for me, particularly, was on summit day, just below the summit. So when I got up to the um, the the rock traverse where, let's say, like the Hillary step would be, my mass started malfunctioning. And the interesting thing is that, you know, I was an armor crewman in a military. And I was the type of person that was always very sort of nitpicky about my gear, attention to detail. And if I had a piece of gear, I wanted to make sure that I knew how to work it, that I could deploy it, and I knew how to problem solve it and everything. And the funny thing is that when they first gave us these masks, it was like in the latest part of the expedition, it was the first time that we've seen them because you only have to use them up in the death zone. So I was like, we're just getting these now. This is a very important piece of gear. And I remember I was the person who asked, what happens if they malfunction? Like, how would they normally malfunction? And they, they walked us through the process of it. And I paid attention and then it happened to me. <laughs> it happened to me and it was terrible. But the, the worst part about it was that it took me quite some time longer than it should have taken for me to accept the fact that my mask was malfunctioning. So I couldn't get a, a full breath of air in through the mask. It was like sort of suctioning to my face. And initially, instead of trying to problem solve right away, I started to just try to push through it like it wasn't happening. But then it caught up, it, it started to catch up with me when I couldn't breathe. That sounds terrifying. So you're talking about your oxygen mask, which you need because you're so high up at altitude. So what did you do? So initially, um, the Sherpa that I was climbing with, I told him about it and we start to try to figure out what could 
possibly be the problem while the mask was still on my face, but still we couldn't figure it out. So I had to take it off. So you can imagine like while I have the mask off my face, I'm not getting, you know, any or not any oxygen, but very little oxygen I'm getting, you know. So I'm just trying to like calm myself down in my head. And what we find is that possibly it was the intake valve was frozen. And so I would have to blow in it to, to sort of release the ice that was stuck in it. And so I figured out a way to sort of cheat the problem a little bit. But it was scary at first there. It was definitely a moment. And it's a weird feeling, too, when you start to realize slowly that your energy is being sapped away because you're not getting enough oxygen in your body. It takes a while for it to register in your mind, you know. It sounds terrifying, Dom. What memories stand out for you? Man, there's so many beautiful things. So one thing that stands out for me, like when I dream about Everest now, right? I dream about during the summit push is the first time in my life that, I, you know, you're just looking out in the distance at really nothing as you're pushing so high on, you know, on this mountain. And it was the first time in my life where I was looking at a thunderstorm from a distance, but I was looking down on it. I was looking at the top of a th thunderstorm in a different mountain range striking the ground. And it looked like, you know, what are those like those orbs with like electricity in it that you see it? You know, it looks something like that. You know, it, it was just incredible. And I remember at the time I was feeling in such pain, you know, because it was so cold and the line is moving slow and like, you know, I, it was excruciating. And I remember I would just look over there and just like take my mind off things for a little bit. But that that was something that that pops in my mind a lot, that visual. Being part of the first black team to climb Mount Everest, you know, how do you think how do you think that changed the outdoor industry and people's perception of climbing? And, you know, what's the response been like amongst the community? It's been incredible. And just about every reaction that you can think of has happened. But like the, the reactions that I appreciate most are just like when people come up to me like at different events and they'll tell me like, you know, that they're hiking or they're getting outside and they're biking or they're bird watching or they're doing, you know, or they're skiing or they're, you know, doing whatever it is that they do outside, you know, getting outside is the point of it. Getting outside, exploring our environment, actually realizing that we are part of our environment so that we care more about our environment and we even take care of it and we, we possess more responsibility for it, right? That's a story that all of us can embrace and all of us should embrace. And so I've been seeing so many different ways that people have been embracing this story of getting outside and exercising, getting outside with their families, doing things that they've never done before. I think it's excellent. So I hear so much of that going on as a result of full circle, particularly in, in communities of color, of people of color. And I think it's, a, it's brilliant. It's really exciting. Full Circle's successful ascent as the first all-black team has garnered attention from all over the world. The crew has done press interviews and traveled to events around the country speaking about their experience on Everest. It was pretty incredible to be part of a team that doubled the number of black climbers to summit Everest, taking the total from 10 to 21. Now that he's back, Dom is also working on a book and he's taking time to incorporate what he learned from the mountain into his personal life. So Everest changes people, and I'm really curious how you changed since summiting, coming back down, telling your story. How did, how did it change you? Man, Shelby, you hit it home. Like, that's the, that is the important question. That's the million dollar question there. And uh, for me, I'm going to tell you, it has been, it has not been an easy change. It has in some way been excruciating. It has in some way been more excruciating than actually climbing Everest. It was definitely life-changing for me. And I think the main thing, you know, I, I would say just reiterate that, you know, I spent about six months in Nepal altogether. So I did what climbers don't generally do when they go to climb Everest. So it was a very long and a sort of gradual burgeoning experience for me. And there's so much that I think about. I've also been writing about it in the last few months. And there's so much that I think about often and just the different things that I even come to understand only recently. 
And so I would say that, you know, spending that much time in the mountains, spending that much time in the Kumbu Valley and then seeing so much of it and then going all the way to the summit gave me a lot of time to think about my life, think about the life that I want to live and the life that I've been living, the decisions that I've been making and the decisions that I would like to make and the decisions that I've been afraid to make. And there's no one there but you to, you know, verify or, you know, reject those points. And so I had a lot of honest conversations with myself. And I could say that, you know, having those serious conversations, those really difficult conversations and having the time to do it and not so much distractions, you know, I'm not always in my phone or in my computer or in, you know, trying to see this person or plan that sort of thing. I'm in the mountains. And so, you know, you have the opportunity to just sit and think about your life. You learn a lot, but what you don't learn is, um, is how to set those things in motion in your life when you come back down. You can have the desire, you can have the vision, but it does, it's not an instru instruction manual for you. And so I wound up having a lot of sort of direction in terms of feelings, emotions about things that I wanted or things that I knew were related to my happiness, but I didn't necessarily know how to deliver on those things. I didn't necessarily know how to rise to the occasion and, 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 and do those things. But I know now, at least I have the vision of, you know, how I want to change my life. Do you think Everest gave you, I mean, did it give you more courage to go do these things that are scary? The thing is, I kind of, uh, I think that Everest is a, it was an indicator for me of my courage, or it was a symbol of the courage that I had, because like, I have always in my life sort of faced the things that were, that I was afraid of. But that's the interesting thing about this expedition is it made me realize the ways that I was doing that with things that were like scary in particular aspects of my life, like a physical adventures, you know, these sort of muscular experiences in life. I was ready for them all the time, throwing myself at them. But the more intimate experiences, experiences that had to do with my emotions and vulnerability, those are things that were terrifying to me. And so I could throw myself at something like Everest because like, you know, this was the fight that I'm used to, you know, my, my physical body, you know, it's me against pain, you know, but then what about like emotional pain? What about like things that hurt your feelings? Those are things that I really shied away from. What do you hope people know about you, Dom, and the work that you want to leave in the world? I think something that's really close to my heart, you know, people can look at something like Everest and it's so spectacular and they could be like, wow, that's amazing that you experienced that, that you did that. You know, it's a bucket list sort of thing and it's so shiny, but we should understand that every day, so many different people are doing amazing things and they're doing the best that they can. You know, it's difficult, especially when you're a perfectionist, like I am as well, you know, you feel like a day's not a good day unless everything's going your way. A day's not a good day unless the effort that you put in, you're getting something back for all of that. With mountaineering, the in interesting thing is like a lot of times you feel like that's not the case. And sometimes you feel desolate because you put in so much effort and actually it's time to turn around because the weather changed on you, you know? And so there's so there are lots of life lessons in that. And I think one of the life lessons that I would take away and that I would share with everybody from my journey to the summit of Everest and back was that you should keep in mind that the context of people's lives are so different. People have so many different types of experiences and, and pains and heartaches and issues and mountains to climb in their own lives. And they might not all be as spectacular and shiny and good to hear about as Everest, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. And so many people, even though it doesn't look like it, you know, they're summiting their Everest every day, you know, and they're trying the best that they can. Dom, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're just a fascinating person and it was an absolute blast to talk with you. I wish you the best of luck with your book and I'm definitely excited to read it when it comes out. To learn more about Full Circle, you can go to their website, fullcircle-expeditions.com. Com. You can also follow Dom on Instagram at Dom the Solifugid. The handle's a little complicated, but it's worth it to see some of the badass pictures he's posted from Everest. That's Dom the Solifugid, D O M 
T-H-E-S-O-U-L-I-F-U-G-I-D. Wild Ideas Worth Living is part of the REI Podcast Network. It's hosted by me, Shelby Stanger, produced by Annie Fassler, Sylvia Thomas, and Sam Pierce Nitzberg of Puddle Creative, and our senior producer is Jenny Barber. Our executive producers are Paolo Motola and Joe Crosby. As always, we love it when you follow this show, rate it, and review it wherever you listen. And remember, some of the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest ideas. Wildest ideas.